YouTube provides tools for rights holders to control the use of their content. The happiest place on earth is a registered Disneyland copyright. Now we're smiling. And it's heading for a great big lawsuit. That's how the law works. Enough is enough! That's how the law works. That's how the law works. Oh, you stupid son of a... The world is a mess. You want to know how I got these scars? You know, at first I thought YouTube's copyright system was a tragedy, and now I realize it's a comedy. I mean, in what other system can you follow all the rules and still get punished just the same as the most treacherous criminals? There's no order, none of the rules mean anything, it's all just complete and utter chaos. It seems that the only thing more laughably cruel than YouTube's copyright system is society itself. <laughs> That's it. You people have stood in my way long enough. I'm going to clown college. Is it just me or is it getting a little corporate out there? Everywhere you go on this website, someone's trying to sell you something. Wait, who said that? Well, anyway, lately it seems that everyone on YouTube is not doing stuff to have fun and just doing it to make a lot of money. It seems like you can't go anywhere anymore without seeing some forced ad that no one cares about. And you guys should know because you're watching one right now. Is this a joke to you? Oh, yes. This video is brought to you by the Ridge family of products. The Ridge Wallet's sleek, minimalist design is perfect for me after copyright claimants stole all of my ad revenue. The day of reckoning will come. Stay tuned. Come on, just try and take the revenue from this ad. This whole plan is insane! Come on, come a little closer. See what happens. I've been waiting for you, Patrick! Oh, sorry, YouTube, if I'm cutting into your family-friendly image. Looks like things just got a little too edgy. Wouldn't want to be non-advertiser friendly on this literal advertisement. Use code EMPLEMON for 10% off your purchase. Sure, go ahead. You can take more of my money too. As a matter of fact, why don't you take what's inside the Ridge Wallet? It's something really special that I saved just for you. It's a downward spiral. Downward spiral! Downward spiral! Downward spiral! Downward spiral! Downward spiral! I turned myself into the physical manifestation of society, Morty. I'm Joker Rack. Enough from the clown. Oh, what's the matter? Aren't you all excited to hear yet another Emperor Lemon rant about YouTube? Isn't that why most of you are here? To listen to me complain? You see, I can scrub off this makeup until I'm ripping the flesh from my skull but it won't make me feel like any less of a clown. Taking off the makeup isn't treating the problem, it's treating a symptom of the problem. You'll never really fix anything until you diagnose the root cause. YouTube's copyright system is a joke, but who's really laughing? I'll admit that throughout this series, my bias has been pretty obvious. I'm not exactly the biggest fan of copyright law because, frankly, I don't respect it. I fancy myself a bit of a copyright radical, an attitude forged from years of making YouTube poops where you learn to treat every piece of media like just another pigment in your artistic palette. I figure as long as you're not directly re-uploading the content for free, then what difference does it make when you use five seconds of a movie scene for a joke? And that's not to say that copyright law is totally worthless. There are certainly valid reasons for establishing copyright protection on some types of content. So when I first released what is now known as the Knife Game song, it gained a lot of internet attention and became a popular trend where many people would record versions of themselves singing my original song. And that was all fine and well, except for the fact that the song was quickly spiraling out of my control. Websites like Gawker and Huffington Post were attributing the song's creation to a 16-year-old Norwegian girl because it probably made for a better story. People were using the song freely on TV shows, and basically, it was looking like the Knife Game song was just going to become absorbed into the internet. The problem was, I was actually trying to sell the song on places like iTunes, so it became necessary for me to go through the process of copywriting the song to solidify my ownership before it was too late. 
So now if shows like Ridiculousness want to use my song in one of their segments, which they have, they have to contact me to negotiate a price. Whereas if I'd never gotten official ownership of the song, anyone could profit off it without me even being recognized as having written it. Theoretically, copyright should function similarly to the patent system by protecting small creators from getting run over by the corporate machine. If you invent a new groundbreaking device, something's got to stop some big company from just stealing your idea, mass producing it, and reaping all the benefits from your hard work. Conversely, when a corporation releases a new product, they get impacted by a much smaller extent from some dude selling a bootleg version at a flea market. Corporations can use their immense resources to continue making money regardless of patent protection. Ideally, copyright should function in a similar way to patents by protecting small artists. But as the laws are currently administered, the opposite is true. Copyright regulation overwhelmingly favors corporations over individuals by an enormous margin. Initially, US copyright law granted a 28-year protection period, comparable to the 20 years granted to patents. Intellectual property rights were kept relatively short for a reason to provide artists and inventors with enough time to effectively market their ideas, but not too much time for them to complacently rest on their laurels. A timely expiration is designed to incentivize artists and inventors to continue innovating and contributing to the welfare of society. When a patent or copyright expires, the intellectual property transfers to the public domain, meaning that it's free to use for everyone thus unlocking even more creative potential. And while patent protection has remained largely the same, copyright protection has been continually and arbitrarily extended to the point of absurdity. Companies like Disney have repeatedly and successfully lobbied Congress to extend copyright protection also that their beloved corporate mascot won't fall into the grubby hands of the public domain. My brand. As a consequence, Copyrighted works created today most likely won't be free to use until over a century from now. And copyrighted works from nearly a century ago are still unusable. The public domain is essentially frozen in time and will likely continue to be as Congress continues to indefinitely extend copyright protection. So instead of characters like Luke Skywalker or songs by the Beatles becoming free for everyone to use, we have to stick to Humpty Dumpty and Old MacDonald the exact same crap people have been using since the 19th century. I don't exactly see people racing to relive public lynchings, diphtheria, and railroad spikes. So why is our public domain stuck in this era? Also, companies like Disney can continue clutching at 90-year-old cartoons, a company that, ironically, became a media empire by animating stories that they adopted from the public domain? Copyright law is a joke. Media companies always like to bemoan how pirating songs or movies hurts the artist when the nasty copyright laws they push have done more to hurt artists than piracy ever could. By forming these huge concentrations of intellectual property and locking them behind a never-ending copyright wall, you are restricting everyone's ability to freely express their creative vision with contemporary media. Remember how my video got claimed for a Cypress Hill song? Well, it turns out that entire genres of music like rap and EDM began by remixing and sampling other copyrighted works. And the same copyright goons that plague YouTube today went after the hip-hop artists of yesteryear. In a 1991 court case, a judge ruled that all sampling required pre-approval from the copyright owner, and essentially crippled what was once a fundamental building block of the rap genre by forcing hip-hop artists to pay licensing fees for all future samples. You know, back in the days before three companies owned every song in existence, musicians were mostly free to borrow ideas, co-op styles, and cover each other's songs without too much issue. Artists understood that adapting older works was a natural part of innovating the medium. Some of the biggest bands from the 60s and 70s built musical empires off the work of lesser known artists from the 40s and 50s. The Beatles truly were fortunate to exist during a time before strict copyright enforcement. If they came up today, they probably wouldn't have had a career at all because ruthless corporate giants would have sued the crap out of them before they even got the taste of fame. But hey, copyright regulation exists to benefit the artist, am I right? 
I'm sure that EMI Warner Music provided fair compensation to Little Richard, Fats Domino, Chuck Berry, Buddy Holly, Carl Perkins, and all of the other artists who made the songs that essentially composed the Beatles' early discography. And I'm sure that after the Beatles got rich and successful and made those music companies a lot of money, future artists had just as easy of a time covering Beatles songs. Does copyright law only matter when you have the corporate backing to squash the worthless plebeians beneath you? Well, yes, of course. Popular musicians nowadays are obligated to nickel and dime every single riff, melody, or lyric that even slightly resembles anything they ever made. So that means no covers of Let It Go from bedroom-dwelling YouTube teenagers and no sampling for hip-hop artists. That's how the law works. And if you don't think that kneecapping an entire musical genre is bad enough, the same copyright goons would later go on to demand royalties from the Girl Scouts of America for singing their copyrighted works as campfire songs. And if that's not enough to convince you of the absolute greed of those in favor of modern copyright regulation, the copyright goons also pried happy birthday to you out of the public domain and into their checking accounts by demanding royalties from any public performance of the song. So just a reminder to all of you out there, if you've ever sang Happy Birthday in public, the most recognized song in the English language, then you are a copyright criminal and owe some company money. Hopefully that will distract you from the fact that the song is 126 years old. It was published in 1893. 1893. 1893. It was published in 1893. Are you getting any copyright claims? What don't you understand about more? All I get are copyright claims. I hope you realize now that any industry claims about how modern copyright laws are designed to help the artist are an absolute crock of shit, and that they actually exist as a battering ram to extort as much money out of individuals and artists as possible by ruthlessly hoarding the ancient, zombified remains of once profitable entertainment properties. So you'll have to forgive me when I say that I don't exactly respect copyright laws, and that copyright smuggling doesn't keep me up at night with guilt. <laughs> it's easy to hate YouTube for copyright missteps, but they aren't the ones making the laws. The fact of the matter is that current copyright legislation is simply incompatible with modern-day peer-to-peer communication on the internet. The laws by which YouTube are forced to comply were drafted during a time when barely anyone used the internet by lawmakers who, to this day, probably still don't understand the internet on a fundamental level. The role of the internet has changed dramatically since 1998 to where it's almost unrecognizable today, yet the law governing content sharing hasn't budged. These stringent copyright laws may have worked 25 years ago when television and newspapers served as information gatekeepers and people still had to pay to listen to music. 25 years ago, you'd pay $10 for a single CD. Now you can pay $10 for access to every song ever made, and it's not even illegal. Music companies have been forced to embrace streaming services because the internet has quite simply transformed the way we treat information and intellectual property. Copyright law still reflects the days when cable TV dominated the media landscape. Back then, media companies were willing to walk on eggshells regarding copyright because those same companies were willing to spend millions of dollars suing each other. TV shows have big enough budgets to comfortably afford licensing fees. They have long enough production cycles to solicit written permission for every piece of media. None of these resources are practical or even available for content creators on YouTube. And this becomes a problem when these big media companies apply the same belligerent, cutthroat policies to online creators that they're used to using on themselves. The fact of the matter is that YouTubers have a totally different attitude towards content creation and content sharing. 
YouTube is by and large a cooperative setting. There's no reason to ruthlessly compete with every channel you encounter because you'd be much better off collaborating with them instead and sharing your audience. Whenever I see any of my content in someone else's video, Downward spiral. I'm gonna dig straight to hell, gamers. My first reaction isn't, Yo, can we copy strike PewDiePie's latest video? It's, That's good. There will come a day when copyright legislation will change to reflect the interests of online artists, but I don't see it happening anytime soon. It turns out that copyright reform isn't that high on the public agenda of problems for our politicians to solve. Even if it were, I'm sure that the geriatric turbo boomers in Congress would probably side with corporate interests anyway. Eventually, the digital cavemen will be outnumbered by younger politicians who pirated a song off Napster at one time in their lives, and copyright law will magically get better. That's what needs to happen in the future, but what can we do to solve the problem now? Well, currently, copyright law is so restrictive of the public domain that it has inadvertently created a black market where everything is public domain. You can look back through history at countless examples where the war on this or prohibition of that did nothing to actually prevent what they were trying to prevent. Authoritarian punishment of natural activities is not only unproductive, but often counterproductive to the welfare of a society. On the internet, Sharing brief clips of television, movies, and music is a natural activity, and many of these companies don't realize that bludgeoning us over the head with copyright claims won't stop people from doing that. YouTubers don't use copyrighted content because they hate media companies and want them to lose money. We use copyrighted content because it's the fundamental language of creative expression on the internet, and by impeding that, you're impeding the progression of culture and art. And what has thus far transpired on YouTube is a cold war of sorts, a battleground between old and new media where each side is content with silently resisting the other. In these trying times, YouTube is stuck with the unfortunate task of attempting to reconcile these vastly different perspectives. YouTube's copyright system was the first of its kind on such a large scale site. It's certainly come a long way, but it still has a long way to go. First of all, copyright claimants should not be in charge of reviewing appeals and counterclaims because of how easily this leads to systematic abuse. If YouTube claims to manually review videos for monetization, then surely they can do the same for copyright disputes. I don't care if they outsource it to some Indian mud farmer who's watching YouTube on a potato. Anything is more fair than having your appeal controlled by the same people who sent the claim in the first place. Second, when a rights holder claims 5 seconds of a 10 minute video, they should not be entitled to 100% of the revenue from that video. It's completely absurd for me to spend over a month on a 43 minute video and not earn a cent of revenue from it because less than a tenth of a percent of it got copyright claimed under false pretenses. A fairer system would be for rights holders to take a share of revenue proportional to the percentage used in the video. That way, Giant Media Corp still gets to reap the rewards of TV show Funny Moments compilations, while more serious YouTubers don't get completely screwed. And finally, YouTube should implement streamlined tools that allow YouTubers to license copyrighted content so we don't have to resort to black market tactics. The entire business of radio is built off running ads between broadcasts of copyrighted music. Radio stations pay a flat annual licensing fee, and after that they're free to stream whatever songs they want. I really don't see how me playing a song as background music is any different from a radio station doing it, and I really don't see why YouTube can't have a similar licensing system. Existing licensing methods are too slow and expensive to be compatible with the fast-paced content on YouTube. It's time to stop nickel and diming every single individual piece of media as if people still go to the record store to pay for songs. Music has already adapted to the streaming age, and licensing should too. Both YouTubers and media companies could benefit greatly from such a system. I'm sure there are plenty of YouTubers who would gladly pay a hundred bucks a year to guarantee that they can use any song they want without getting copyright claimed. And even if you don't like that premise, you can't deny that it should at least be an option for those who do. This year, YouTube has already shown that they're willing to take steps towards reforming the copyright system, but they still have a lot of work to do before the system becomes truly equitable. Until then, media companies will keep strangling us with claims, 
YouTubers will keep finding ways to get around them, and the YouTube copyright metagame will continue. So I guess at the end of the day, the lesson of this whole series is to just use Rusty Cage's background music in all your videos, because he's too busy stealing slushy machines and epoxying dead rats to worry about sending you a claim. Originally, I was going to end this video with Entry of the Gladiators. You know, the clown theme. But unfortunately, that song is going to get me copyright claimed. Well everyone, that's finally the end of my three-part copyright detour. Hope you guys liked it. I know that nowadays it's kind of difficult to pay attention to these specific issues, especially considering YouTube creates a new crisis seemingly every week now. But copyright is an issue that's really bothered me for basically the entire time I've made videos on this website, and I'm glad that I finally got a chance to talk about it here. If you're interested in watching more content regarding copyright issues, I highly recommend this video by Bedhead Bernie about the more philosophical problems with modern copyright regulation. So thanks for watching everyone, be sure to check out that Ridge wallet, and I will catch you in the next one.